morning and uh, welcome to day four of Carfums 2018. Um, this morning we'll have the uh, last keynote address uh, of this conference and it is my honor and privilege uh, to introduce you to, uh, to Louisa Taylor. Uh, Louisa Taylor is uh, the co-founder and director of Refugee 613, uh, an information and mobilization hub. Um, uh, it's a network of community uh, partners in Ottawa to support and welcome uh, the integration of refugees uh, here in Ottawa. Refugee 613 provides information and training uh, to the public, volunteers and private sponsors uh, of refugees, foster, fosters collaboration uh, between service providers and develops pathways for public engagement in refugee support. Uh, Louisa uh, was an award-winning uh, newspaper journalist in her previous life. Uh, she's also the co-founder of uh, DataFest OTT, which uses collaborative learning uh, to explore intersections between social challenges and digital technology, and serves on the advisory committee of so on social innovation, which brings designers and practitioners together to develop new policy ideas in settlement and integration for Canada's federal government. As a graduate student who arrived in uh, Canada in 2015 to undertake my doctoral research on forced migration issues, I was particularly curious to find out more about how institutions and grassroots organizations function to enable effective, durable solutions uh, for refugees. In the last few years, of course, um, this comes as no doubt to anyone that forced migration issues have been at the forefront uh, for policymakers, academics, and state institutions alike, uh, at least more specifically in Canada. However, it is significant to recognize the role of people like Louisa and uh, local institutions like Refugee 613 with respect to such issues. I'm not going to say much more uh, about the coalition, of course. Uh, so therefore, without much further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Louisa Taylor to deliver the keynote. Is this on now? Okay, great. I'm using multiple forms of technology. I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, thank you, Jay. Thank you, James, for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I had grand ambitions to attend uh, the whole conference. There were so many people I wanted to hear from. Um, but the reality of life uh, working on the at the grassroots and the front lines intervened, and I barely carved out enough time to get uh, here today. So you're, you're going to hear that theme a bit um, in the rest of the discussion. So uh, this is the title that James and I came up with, and, and I'm going to be fairly irreverent today. Um, I think that on a Friday morning, um, nobody wants to be uh, too weighed down, but what, I'm going to slip some serious in there as well. So the first thing I want to tell you about is this beautiful thing that happened recently. Uh, a young academic came to my team and said, I have money to do some research on something related to your field. What would be useful to you? And my team and I fell to our knees and wept with joy. Then we tested her. We tested her with meetings and questions and pushback. And now we're about to start working together on something that will be immensely valuable to our work. And, and so it turned out to be true. She's as great as uh, she seemed in her first uh, um, introduction. And after every meeting with her, my project coordinator sends me messages on Slack in all caps, I love her. <laughs> and she loves her so much because she's doing everything right and everything that makes sense for us and for the people we work with and because it doesn't happen for us very often. Uh, and so I tell you this because I know it's possible, this beautiful relationship between researchers and practitioners. It's happened before, it's happening now for some of you, uh, and for me, it, and it will happen again, but it needs to happen more frequently. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Why is this relationship between forced migration researchers and the practitioners too often fraught with tension when we all want the same thing? We all want for pe people at risk to find refuge and welcome and build successful new lives in our communities. So how can we make it happen more often? All right, so we're going to test this. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through uh, a bit about us at Refugee 613 and what we do. I'm going to talk a bit about this relationship I just uh, mentioned. I'm going to talk about what some of my colleagues on the practitioner side feel. 
uh, about you, positive and negative, uh, and how we might get closer to being allies. So I have to warn you, there's zero academic rigor to this presentation. Uh, I did no uh, surveys, I have no numbers, well, I have a handful of numbers, uh, but I have no bar charts or fever graphs, uh, but I've got lots of bullets. I'm a big fan of, of bullets in presentations. Okay, so this is a bit about us. Um, Re Refugee 613 is a bit of a Johnny-come-lately. Uh, we formed in 2015 in response to the Syrian uh, influx uh, because a lot of people in the city, partners, <clears throat> settlement providers, health, education, uh, volunteers, sponsors, wanted to do a better job as a community of uh, welcoming the Syrians. We knew we had infrastructure. We also knew that we needed to scale up. I'm wondering, is this readable with all the lights on, or should we dim the lights? It's OK? OK. Um, so we wanted to give the, uh, the public a pathway to be engaged. We wanted to help. Uh, oh, thank you. OK, it's probably a little better. Uh, and we wanted to help um, with information sharing. So these are some of the original founders of Refugee 613, and the majority of them still sit on our stakeholder table. There are representatives from settlement, faith groups, school boards, um, LGBTQ, uh, community volunteers, uh, sponsorship agreement holders, employment agencies, uh, health agencies, and, um, and community organizations, and uh, le um, refugee law. So uh, they're the guiding body of Refugee 613. They meet bi-monthly to exchange information, flag issues and successes, and collaborate on solutions. And then project activities are carried out by my team, which is right now five uh, full-time, and we're, we're about to grow substantially. So really at the core of what we do is this belief that when you give people the tools to act on their compassion, you also build relationships and networks and strengthen communities. But it doesn't always happen organically. You have to kind of insert and seed those connections to make it possible. So this is our website. And uh, our model, the reason I'm showing you that is because our model puts communications at the core of everything we do. So the sharing of information in person and online multiple platforms, different ways, meetings, one-on-one, -on -one, stakeholder groups, working groups. It's our core business. Um, and settlement and sponsors were our primary audiences because we were focusing on the Syrians when we first arrived. But um, now settlement sponsors and refugees um, are our three primary audiences. And as a result, Refugee 613 has become the go-to resource for information and connection for settlement and sponsorship in Ottawa. Um, and, uh, and what we're finding is when I do presentations like this in other parts of the country, I'm always looking for um, the, the, the refugee 613 of that jurisdiction. And I never find exactly the same model. I do find people who are doing bits of what we're doing. But um, we're all, I, I say that because um, I want to hear if you know others who are doing similar work, because we're trying to build a global community of practice, um, talking to people who are doing similar work on communication for refugee issues. Um, and I know that sounds insanely broad, but that's, um, that's where we're casting a wide net right now. Um, so right now, we, um, we know people who do some communications as a result of their settlement work. We don't know anybody who focuses on communications, other than the, the tech NGOs like um, Tech Fujis. So our three pillars of work are inform, connect, and inspire. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and I'll explain a bit about that. Um, this is the closest I get to lots of numbers. Oops. Here we go. Ah! So we put this together last December um, to talk about our impact. Um, so we provide information to multiple audiences in a variety of ways. We provide logistical planning and promotional support to training for private sponsors. We do the same for service providers. We communicate out to the general public to give them a better understanding of what's happening. Because if you leave an information vacuum, someone else will fill it. Uh, and we help people find pathways to be involved. And then the connect part of what we do is, is, the, is the, the bringing people together, whether it's connecting a member of the public or a settlement professional or a business person with a partner who can help them realize their vision or their idea or um, 
with an opportunity to volunteer, to donate, to sponsor, or referral. Uh, we convene collaborative responses to emerging issues, uh, for example, around the ongoing rise in refugee claimants. Uh, we then disseminate that information to wider audiences through newsletters, meetings, and one-on-one -on -one discussions. This, uh, yeah, this is the connect part, which I think I just went over. This is one of our um, most, uh, what should I say, we're proudest of, of this because um, what I mentioned earlier, we're about to, to, to grow. Uh, we created a WhatsApp group where we took the model of the, um, the sort of grassroots groups that prompt that started with um, other refugee groups as well, but we were noticing among the Syrians that they were creating WhatsApp groups and sharing information. And what a valuable resource that was, except for one thing, there was often the quality of the information was really poor. So we looked at how could we connect people to services better, because often they were trying to answer questions themselves and they didn't understand there was a service that could help them with that. And that's been a, a long-standing issue for settlement, is how to connect with their potential clients. Um, and so we created a WhatsApp group uh, that is in, it's in Arabic, 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. You can ask any question you want related to settlement and integration. Our partners at the Y will uh, give you an answer within 24 hours. We also provide, uh, you can do it by voice note if literacy is an issue. Uh, you can do it by private message if, uh, if, it's a, if it's a sensitive question. All the questions and answers will be shared in the group so everybody can learn. We've had huge success with this. We're now up to 382 members, and people tell us that it's their go-to, it's their place that for trusted information. The, um, the existing group uh, continues, and we've, we worked very closely together, and we consulted them before we started the new group. Um, we just felt it was important to have a separate group because the other group has a big social component, whereas our group, no religion, no politics, and, and nothing about your personal life, please. Um, and, uh, and people really appreciate that. In fact, they monitor each other when someone starts to, to, uh, to tread on one of those. I'm happy to talk about, oh, so the scaling up is that we're um, going to be expanding to another language and we're going to be working with partners in other cities to test other ways to use digital messaging for settlement and integration. Uh, this is an example of another role that we've played, bringing um, information to refugee claimants uh, who don't have sponsors and often aren't connected with settlement and will appear in the city and not know how to connect with services. And this is a physical brochure. It's, there's also a digital version. Uh, this is the prototype. I actually think this has been edited since. Um, but uh, we produced this with a, um, a group called Renew, the Refugee Network of Ottawa, which is a group of frontline uh, settlement workers who uh, deal primarily with refugee claimants. As a group, we saw a need to fill this gap to give claimants more access to information in the early, early stages of their arrival. And um, so it was Renew's idea and Refugee 613's role was to sort of be the, the comms agency and work on, do the editing, uh, the production, and the distribution. That uh, first printing of over a thousand copies went out the door super fast and we've got lots of demand, so we're doing another copy and then we're going to evaluate and tweak it and uh, we hope get funding to produce it in multiple languages. And so lastly, Inspire. <clears throat> we haven't been doing as much of this as we would like because we simply haven't had the capacity. But in the next uh, year or two, we're going to be developing a comprehensive advocacy policy because our stakeholders really want us to be a voice supporting refugees and refugee issues, um, working in tandem with the Canadian Council for Refugees and other allies to find where our voice, uh, what is our niche, what can we add to the conversation that supports our allies uh, and doesn't duplicate. Where does our funding come from? Uh, the investment of private donors, large and small, in our project has been pivotal. The province of Ontario uh, really got us off the ground, but uh, the Community Foundation of Ottawa and individual philanthropists have been uh, hugely important in sustaining our work. Uh, and, uh, and now we're about to get funding from IRCC for the first time for the, for the um, digital messaging. So really this sort of sums up what our work has taught us. It's really that um, why we talk about Inform, Connect, Inspire. There's a lot of overlap between the three, but this essentially sums it up. So 
that's intentionally blank. <laughs> so two and a half years into our existence, we've seen a few things. We've talked to partners about the things they've seen, and we've learned a bit about researchers and settlement. So settlement, I'm using in br very broad terms. I really mean primarily the people who uh, work with refugee, refugees of all categories uh, as professionals on a regular basis, but it can also be uh, people who wouldn't necessarily be situated in a refugee serving agency, um, a settlement agency, but maybe you're at a health agency and see refugee claimants or um, refugee clients. Um, so what do we have? We have the context. You're looking at something specific and when you come to us, we see all the connections. We're thinking about context. Settlement has the expertise uh, day in, day out, working with clients. Uh, we know about different um, needs. We know we have um, uh, specific uh, cross-cultural um, understanding and competency. And um, that's an expertise that is not valued highly enough. I should say in general, the settlement, um, it, the biggest shock to me coming to this sector was how the, the, um, the extent to which settlement feels undervalued by other professionals, that their work has not been respected. And um, that was, that's been shocking to me and I didn't understand it, but it, later I understood what they were talking about because I saw it with my own eyes. Um, and I also think it's important to understand that mindset is that often when you're talking to settlement workers, you're talking to someone who's been around the block with people who haven't respected that they actually know what they're doing and that they're not just some kind of amateur. So we have insights. We have, we've seen what's happened before, we see what's going on now, and we have ideas and we have thoughts on why it's happening and what's going on. And of course, this is what researchers tend to come to us for the most is the contact wanting to connect with our clients. So we have it, you want it. Go to the next slide. Okay, I'm not sure why that happened. <laughs> okay, we've been through these. Can you advance to the next slide, James? Okay, I'll tell you what's ha coming on the next slide. Hang on. Uh, no, because that's... Yeah. Okay, hang on. Let's go to 16. Well, too far, too far. No, it's too far. Okay, let's try that. Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, ah! Okay, so obviously data, evidence, you have it. You have, you have your understanding and your, um, your, your work that has come before, your canon. Uh, and you have evidence that we can't take the time to find or, or think about. So you have this thoughtful, useful data, and, and it has the potential to enhance our practice. You have the expertise to do the investigation uh, and to get it right. You bring your own insights from the, your other work, and you have the time that we wish we had to dig into something and figure out why or what's going on. So often in our work we say, oh, wouldn't it be great to study X and really understand what's happening here? And researchers have that time and so we, we're, we're quite envious of you for that. So you have it, we want it. Okay, let's hope that we can move to the next slide with no problem. Oh man. Okay, yep, back to the hands. So in theory, we should join hands and walk into the sunset together. We should be allies, we should be friends. And in some cases, obviously, we do. Oh, yeah. So in the cases where we do, where it works, uh, what's happening? 
what makes it work. I asked my friends in the settlement uh, a few, to, to tell me about um, what are the qualities of the researchers they work with uh, successfully uh, that they love. So here, I'm gonna go out here. So first of all, that they care about the practical implications of their work. How is that work going to have an impact on the ground? That they are committed to truly giving back to practice, and I should add in there also to the subjects of the research. Uh, and I don't just mean, um, you know, two years from now giving us a copy of your abstract. Uh, I mean truly looking at how can your work be implement, implemented, in, engaged in the, in the practice. Um, that they listen more and instruct less. The really great uh, researchers uh, spend a lot more time listening at the beginning, uh, not necessarily asking research questions, but asking questions to understand the context. They connect to what's happening on the ground. It's very similar to are committed to truly giving back to practice. And they're humble, compassionate, and caring about the people they are studying. This is huge. Um, and as you'll see in the next slide. Uh, that the researchers take the time to understand the sector. How does settlement work? How is it funded? What are the constraints on the staff that you're calling or emailing? Hugely important. They're aware of their footprint, the impact that their work has on practice. And they recognize that what they are asking often falls outside what the practitioner is funded to do. When I first came to this sector, I didn't think much of that question. I didn't understand the practical implications. Every settlement agency you talk to, every settlement worker is, for the most part, there are some exceptions, for the most part, they are funded to deliver X client to X, X service to X client. They are not funded to sit and talk to you about your study. And this is massive. They may want to, but if they spend that time with you, they are not achieving the deliverables that the government usually is funding them to achieve. So you are forcing them to work and squeeze you into their day. And you have to be respectful and understanding of that. And some are, some are fantastic. Okay, so. <laughs> When we're working with researchers we love, I had fun with stock photos, as you can tell. Um, first of all, none of us, not settlement, not you guys, uh, dresses like that on a regular basis. But look at how happy they are. <laughs> she's thinking, wow, he's respecting my time. And she's thinking, oh my god, this will be so great for our clients. And he's thinking, I wish this had happened sooner. This is going to have big impact. And he's thinking, yay, I'll get my research done, I'll get my paper in, everything will be great. So what about the ones that maybe make things, that cause friction, that things are a little more difficult? This is, um, these are direct quotes from colleagues in settlement, not just here in Ottawa, but in other cities. Those researchers come in trying to prove their theory instead of coming in and listening to the practitioners or the subjects. They don't take the time to find the value for the practitioner. They assume everyone is happy to contribute for the greater good. This is where the tension with what they're funded for comes in. They don't look for meaningful ways to connect their results to practice. We've already come, come upon that one. And they fail to see their research subjects as people who can add value and insight. Too often the research subjects are, are just sort of literally the guinea pigs. Study sub studies or subjects like a science exhibit. Mistake their, mistake their timelines for those of the practitioners. We are often are working it on very different timelines. Haven't learned how to work with vulnerable people. This is really big. We've had researchers come to us, especially students, I'll be honest with you, uh, who say, hi, can, I, uh, can you connect me to um, 50 refugees, uh, Arabic speaking uh, Syrian refugees, um, by next week, and um, I need an interpreter, and I need this and I need that. And we don't want to be rude. We don't want to say no to people. I think that's the fundamental thing I'd like to leave you with. Nobody wants to say no, but we're forced to when we're asked unreasonable questions. 
uh, don't see how their own privilege and biases impact their findings. And I think this is the one that, uh, this is the one that, um, hang on. Well, I'll just see if it's the one. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is someone who did not have a good experience. All right. So how can we do better? Yeah, see? These are the folks who've been around the block with researchers before, and they're not impressed. He's thinking, wasting my time. She's thinking, this guy does not know the first thing about working with vulnerable people. You don't ask questions like that. You don't approach it in this way. I think she's thinking about lunch. So how can we make, turn this into a beautiful relationship instead of one of friction and close some of these gaps? First of all, Take, I really recommend you take the time to become sector literate. Understand the parameters and the constraints for people working in settlement. Understand that they are extremely overworked, underpaid, disrespected on a regular basis. They face um, all kinds of demands for um, uh, reporting. They have deliverables that have to be their priority. Uh, and, uh, and also, that they are forced by the funding structure to be in competition with each other very often. Uh, so sometimes, you know, within the settlement sector itself, it really varies what part of the country uh, you're in. In Ottawa, we're pr quite collaborative, but we still have, you know, a, a healthy level of competition. And, um, and sometimes, you know, I joke that we need to do some couples therapy. Um, but having said that, I have friends <laughs> in the academy, and it, it sounds like you guys know a bit about that. Uh, so... <coughs> It's, it's, a, it's a natural human condition. Come in, oh, look at that, two ones. Uh, ask practitioners what they need and actually listen. So what that means is, you know, it's great if you come in and ask what they need, but are you gonna listen when what they need does not square with your interests? Uh, and are you going to try to force that square peg into the round hole? Co-design, go beyond consulting to be truly collaborative as early as possible in the process. Uh, so what you don't want to do is send a letter, uh, asking for a letter of support a week before your, um, your proposal is due and say, here's the role we see for you uh, and uh, can you send us a letter? Um, that's not going to win you any friends. Uh, be flexible, responsive and respectful. I think you know why based on the things that we just talked about. And, it, and as much as possible, look for ways to include funding for settlement expertise and for the subjects. In some cases, it's going to be entirely appropriate for you to compensate uh, um, the refugees themselves for their time. Not everybody is able, uh, has the privilege to do everything for the greater good. Uh, and so, um, and, and in terms of settlement, talk to settlement. You know, if we can get funding for you, how can we make this easier for you? Uh, if I could get some funding for you, what would that look like? How would we build it in? Oops. So then you can go from this to this, and I'll be happy in your beige suits, and we can walk off in the sunset together. That's it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jay didn't get the memo. He <laughs> <laughs> didn't, Tess. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for the wonderful presentation uh, and, and for ending uh, this conference with a wonderful uh, what to do and what collaboration is going to look like. We had the first day when Salem was talking about the refugee network, and then we have. Uh, uh, Heaven Crowley talking about the co collaboration between research policy and, and, and how that impacts. And then we had yesterday the North South, and you talking about what we are going to do here on the collaboration side. Uh, um, I, I am a little biased when it comes to Luisa, and uh, <laughs> we shared the journalism background. She reminds me one of those people when I was sitting in African refugee camps who saved my life the journalists as colleagues who are giving mm -hmm. me information tirelessly where to go and how to escape and where 
what are the resources? So the first time when I saw her, when the refugee, uh, Syrian refugee was coming in, and when you were uh, establishing the 613, I said, okay, here she is. <laughs> this is the model. And uh, the next time I met her is when I was doing the research on the Syrian refugee itself. She doesn't only talk about it, and she doesn't only uh, tell you advice about how to do it. She actually does it in action. And someone who have been uh, working in the resettlement field for 20 years, with when I had 170 caseloads, mm -hmm. and then a researcher comes in and talk, wants to talk to me, I understand those dilemmas and, and, and how it is. But what I admire most about you is give you time. It doesn't to, matter what time it is. I have to say Nemo is one of the good ones. <laughs> <laughs> no, you had you had people engaged from the early stage. Yeah. I said, Louisa, I need you to be participant. And she said, yes. I, look, I came back again. I said, Louisa, I want you to be the keynote speaker in the forum I'm organizing in Ottawa. She said, yes. <laughs> and here we are again. So, and the good thing is uh, we also, we are continuing this conversation and um, that started when you, James and you had a, a conversation about how we are going to really collaborate and what we are going to do between the University of Ottawa and uh, Carleton University. We got the funding and we are going to start this conversation and how to do better in, in the fall. Very exciting. Yes, yes but thank you for doing <coughs> all the work that you are doing and so thank you for continuously encouraging the academics, the policy makers, the service providers, encouraging the refugees of how to settle. Actually, I saw her in action, how she was working with the Syrian refugees who, were, who, who I was interviewing. So that's what we need when it comes to academics or whether we are really working in the field, whether we are policy makers, really doing what we say, what we are doing, showing it in action, not just for our careers, but showing the product and, and establishing collaboration. Okay, so now I'm going to open <laughs> questions for you. Hmm? I have a problem with walking, so I'm oh, going to use a microphone. Jake's, Jay's legs <laughs> to run around. Hi, it's uh, Mustafa again from Network for Refugee Voices. Um, I have a few comments and questions. Um, I hope you'll be open-minded to my comments and questions. Okay, um, in terms of uh, the uh, tra provide training for sponsors, I hope that you guys are working with the RSTP team. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's what they're doing. Um, I also, with the WhatsApp group, there are a lot of WhatsApp groups um, like all across the country, especially with refugees from Vancouver to Halifax to Toronto. Mm -hmm. Um, all of that. Actually, um, I wish what you can integrate to it, just trying to work a little bit also with the Facebook groups that have been there's Also over, I think, 50 Facebook groups that has thousands of people, refugees connecting, so that would be a mm -hmm. good thing. Um, on a comment, you um, you did say about Voices for Refugee. I hope you can, or you are planning to bring refugees to those voices, not the voices of non-refugees for refugees. Um, the settlement, that's, um, that's what I'm going to disagree with you on a lot of things, but <laughs> let's just do it. I have so much problem with settlement workers and settlement agencies because yes, they do have the experience, but it seems that when they do it for years, um, they seem to get to a point where I know what I'm doing and they would not be open to any other suggestions. And that's especially happening with refugees. Mm -hmm. This happens on every. And if you want the biggest proof for this, you gotta take a look at the link the programs yeah. that even like teaching. It's not settlement workers, but I know it's just kind of the same mentality been doing it for years. So I think it's uh, not really more training on researchers um, of, like to respect the time or the work of, of settlement. We all respect that. But I think that also settlement workers need a lot of training when it comes to dealing with refugees and how to work with them. And I'm talking from personal experience and from many experience not only in Toronto, Ottawa, everywhere, part of the network, I'm in nationally too. Um, I think the last comment I will bring that was also from my own experience end up dealing mainly with grassroots and community leaders. So I don't see it happening much, like especially right now in Toronto, I see them working a lot with grassroots and refugee leaders or even community leaders just to do their research and not really as much as like, you know, with settlement workers and in that sense. Thank you. Thank you. 
that's great. God, I thought it was going to be worse when you asked me to be open-minded. Um, <clears throat> absolutely, we know we're, we didn't invent the WhatsApp group. We're just trying to improve it. Uh, and um, capacity, we'd love to work with Facebook groups as well. But the, the nature of our project is um, that we're going to be looking at digital messaging specifically. Um, but we'll also be looking at the different platforms that people use. We just had to pick one. Um, your comment about um, the settlement sort of it's my way or the highway idea. I know that happens. I see it regularly as well. Um, I think it's important to understand why. And a lot of it is about the lack of respect and the conditions and the structure that they're in. Uh, so what would be great is research about settlement itself and the process and the nature of those relationships um, done in a sensitive manner could help. And the sector itself recognizes that you know it is professionalizing. Um, but there is there is a long way to go, that's true. Um, but I also think that it's important to remember that the Syrian influx was like a tsunami for the settlement sector. There are so many people in settlement now like me who were never there before. They don't have training, they don't have experience, and a lot of them didn't know what they were doing. And you had people, community members coming in and working who didn't understand ethics, boundaries, um, uh, confidentiality, all that kind of thing, uh, and didn't understand their role. And then you had people who were kind of interpreting their experience, as you say, from 10 or 15 years ago or 20 years ago to today. So one of the issues is that the funding structure and, and the nature of the sector does not encourage a lot of innovation and a lot of lean and nimble responsiveness. And, and, um, and so I absolutely hear you. Um, a big part of what I do is explain settlement to people outside settlement and explain outside settlement to people in settlement. Uh, and, and it would be great if we can get to a point where there's more connection there. But they have been, um, there's been no incentive for them to be nimble and innovative. Uh, there's been no incentive for them to step outside the little box that their funders put them in. I think it's just important to remember that. But I think it's also a great opportunity for, for uh, practices to really get better. Yes, yeah. But I've also had, but I've also had people, I, I love Mario and, and Costi's great, but I've also had people talk my ear off about what's wrong with Costi. So the one thing to remember is a lot of it is also very much about the personal relationship, the personal experience that one person had with one staff member, right? It can, it can sour everything. But I think those are all, that's all great insights. Thank you. Sure, yep. I'm just taking notes. I'm not texting my kid or anything. <laughs> I did forget to turn my phone off during a presentation recently, uh, and uh, and it was I saw it was my daughter, so I it rang while I was speaking, and I saw it was my daughter, so I thought it was an emergency, and I got <laughs> yes, <laughs> can we eat the donuts? Oh my god! <laughs> Later, I said, you know, I was in the middle of my presentation, and she said, well, at least I asked. <laughs> uh, thank you, Louisa, for your presentation. I, I find it very inspiring. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts about the knowledge dissemination part and giving back, because that's what I struggle with. The, the, um, sorry, the what part? The knowledge dissemination. So okay. what, after we are done with our research, mm -hmm. how do we actually give back? Um, and I'm struggling a little bit with that, because as you said, the, the workers in the settlement sector are very busy. They don't necessarily want to take the time to come and listen to what we found after the three years study. Um, you don't want to read our abstracts either. So what is the best way for disseminating, sharing what we have learned through our research? Thanks very much, Louisa. That was that was fantastic. And and my question actually goes very well with, with, with Charles because it, it's actually sort of that's at the sort of at one end of, of the process and mine is very much at the beginning. In your presentation I heard a bit of a paradox that on the one hand the practitioners are overworked, that it's not part of their job description or their allocation of time to invest in relationships with the research community, that it is additional. 
but at the same time, the message, and we've talked about this, and I very much agree, that it's not so much about coming in for sort of a, a quick relationship, but I don't want to take the analogy too far, but, you know, it's not coming in for sort of just a, a, a very uh, quick interaction, but it's very much investing the time in building a relationship that then lays the foundations for which is a very time-consuming process. So it's a paradox of, on the one hand, the relationships are best when they start as a relationship, and then the question of research needs and projects sort of comes up over time. So I guess my question is, you know, how, what advice can you give on the best way to frame those first contacts of we want to start a relationship, or we want to start having this contact, but also what sort of guidance can more established scholars give to graduate students who are starting in the field in terms of, you know, if you know that you're working on this project for two years or four years or five years, you know, at what point do you want that conversation to begin? So how to find the balance between the constraints on time but the need to invest time? And at the same point, you know, do you want those very tentative, I'm at the beginning of my PhD, I have two years of coursework to do before I'm doing my research, but I think I might want to do something about refugees in two years' time. It, so w what practical guidance can you give on when that, you know, when the pickup line should be used to begin <laughs> the relationship? Uh, oh, sorry, we can take another one? Or? Um, let me just do these yeah. two. Sure. Uh, I'm going to start with James and then I'll come back to you. Uh, I think that whenever someone has come to us uh, very with a very open-ended, uh, let me get to know you and see what research I can do to support you, we, we make the time. And we make the time willingly because we see that there could be a benefit for us and that you're not coming in with a box you're just going to try to fit us into. Uh, so coming in early on and very open-minded is great. It'd be great if, you're, if you've um, done enough research to understand what the organization does, um, the, the local landscape, et cetera, so that they're not you know, giving you the absolute base. They're not being forced to, to give you, you know, Settlement 101. But um, you may, you know, naming a, a general area of interest early on and asking, can we have a talk about this? I'd like to see if there's work that I can do that will help you. Uh, I think a lot of settlement practitioners are going to take that well. It's when you get the email that says, I'm doing my PhD on refugees with red shoes uh, who live in, uh, who are from Syria and, and live in Cornwall. So what, right? Maybe, maybe there's someone who wants that, but maybe that's not what I'm interested in. And, and so it's to have that kind of, that, that flexibility, which I know is going to be hard for some folks um, because of the, the structures of, of research. Um, but fundamentally, to come in early and make it clear that you're being open-minded is going to get you more of the time that you're looking for. And then to actually pay attention um, to what comes back um, from you is really helpful. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. I would just want to sort of make the claim, um, you know, certainly my experience working with practitioners in the international context that that advice is, is transferable. And so I think yeah. it's sort of a general principle of, you know, to, to be willing and able to start the conversation when you know that there's the opportunity to ask questions that are of relevance, but before there's sort of, the, you're, you're bound to ask a certain kind of question. So I, that's yeah. just something that I would put out there in terms of the generalizability of that advice. Yeah. And, and I would add to that, that maybe the first contact or second contact you make in discussions, you realize that where you're, you're, what you're interested in is not what they're interested in, and that's okay. And you just you cut your losses and you acknowledge that. But you can also say, do you know anybody in the sector who might be interested in what I'm interested in? Um, so they can be your connection to other things. But they may say, you know, if you take what you're thinking about and you turn it this way, you may really be onto something. Um, then it's you know it's all about that flexibility. Um, Knowledge dissemination is tough. It's really tough. You know, we're doing it all the time. We're putting it on multiple platforms, different audiences. Um, again, the first thing I would say is whoever you're working with, ask them. 
what would be useful for you at the end? Would you like me to come and do a presentation to you and your colleagues? Um, you know, would you, and, and we would hope that they would be interested enough in your conclusions that they would have buy-in and that they would be saying, yeah, I'll set it up. And they would be your, your um, uh, sort of champion in the workplace. Um, so the first thing I would say is, is ask. Um, the second thing is um, look for local networks. Look for, um, you know, uh, kind of coalitions and other people who might be interested in what you uh, have to say, not just the, the folks you worked with. Um, and it's true, uh, you know, the, the nature of the work is that most frontline staff are not going to have time uh, to read the articles. But if you can, if you can crunch it down and give it to them and here are the implications and here's what I see. Um, and, and to have a feedback session, uh, probably even before you have some kind of presentation to their workplace, a feedback session with them. Here's, here's what I'm saying. Like I've, I've uh, only really had reports sent to me. I haven't had a let's get together and I'll tell you what I learned and, and the limitations and my recommendations, things like that. Um, I'm probably forgetting something, but, um, and I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one conversations, uh, or if there's a group of people that helped you, you know, you with them. Um, but again, start by asking them what would work for them and, uh, and build out from there and be really creative. You know, one of the, um, one of the maxims, one of the rules that we live by uh, in the communications field is meet your audience where they are. So that's why we went with WhatsApp. They were all on WhatsApp. And people are like, well, why aren't you talking to them through Facebook? Or why aren't you talking to them? You know what? In Ottawa, this group is on WhatsApp, so we go to them. And so for communication to be effective, you've really got to think about your, who's your audience? Who do you want to read this? Where are they? And what channel or method would work for them? And, and you can only do that by asking them. That's your market research. <laughs> so we have time for three more questions. So let's start here. If you don't mind introducing yourself uh, before asking the question. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I'm Joe Taro coming from Japan. Actually, I was a practitioner uh, working on irregular migrants in Japan, and now I'm become a PhD student. And my question is, uh, I want to know, so there are some good experience you work with researcher and practitioner together, likes to doing the research together, or some project together. Is there a specific example I'd like to know? Uh, oh, sorry, right, we're taking more than one. Yep. Uh, I'm Aziz from University of Manitoba. My question is, you, you mentioned in, in, in your recommendations, include funding for settlement expertise and for subjects. So for a PhD student, uh, I will need help from the settlement organizations for recruitment of refugees. And so in that case, how I can negotiate these things? can pay for like uh, their time and expertise and and how can I include uh, is there any charter or any any policy guidelines for work, uh, working with the settlement organizations uh, for your research work? yeah hi hi Mike how are you I'm well and you hi uh, and first of all uh, kudos to the organizers for this was the missing piece of the conference. We started out, uh, yeah, I know that. <laughs> I almost had a heart attack. But, uh, uh, we started out, uh, on Monday looking at sort of knowledge upward to the, to the high level policy makers. And I've, be I've become more and more convinced with the, over the last five years when I've started to really start paying attention to the settlement sector and the, and the settlement uh, service providing organizations across the country. I have been uh, I've been more concerned about how on earth the, the research community and and the, the service providers actually work together. I think the the net the, the connections with the with, 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 with the government and with the immigration department under this ministry in particular uh, are as good as I, I've seen in, in, in 50 years. Uh, but I still see a big gap between the, the people on the front line studying what's going on and uh, the, you know the creation of say a 500 page uh, study is all very well 
but what does it mean in terms of making life better for the people who are serving the refugees and the refugees? So uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to see that, that this part of the story is now is now fitting into place. Uh, just a, 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 and, and the just in, in terms of research, it's, it seems to escape escaped a lot of people's attention that in the last uh, 20, 25, maybe 30 years, but in almost every major city in Canada, uh, the settlement agencies have, uh, have become much more professional uh, and have a couple of really interesting characteristics. They tend to be tremendously deeply rooted in their communities. In Calgary, when, the, when Ferro Boris, who runs the Catholic system out there, wants the, the, the local head of Safeway and the meatpacking plants and, and the guys who run the, uh, the resorts in Banff to come to a meeting, they come. They, they have that kind of, tend to have that kind of club uh, across the, <coughs> the country. And there's a, whole, there's a whole category who, uh, unfortunately, aging entrepreneurial humanitarians running these organizations who seem to have escaped the notice of the research community and, and and yet, they, they, when, when that tsunami hit us, that's, that, that was what had to cope with it. And, um, and, they, you know, and, and cope with it in situations where they were being overwhelmed. Uh, in BC, the head of uh, ISSI out there got 6,000 offers of help. Uh, what do you do with 6,000 offers of help? Uh, and in, in many cases, by the time the, the wave went, by the time the wave was, had passed through, settlement agencies, the immigration department finally found the funds you know, for the, all the extra staff. So I, I, I really think that those those institutions are a, a proper subject of study. Uh, I, I would I would also add, but I would also say uh, sometimes when coming in as an outsider, it, it looks like the field is has gone from very empty to rather crowded. Can you, in, and in, in, the, in the case of Ottawa, can you explain how in roles and, and mandate between 613, Ottawa Local Immigration Partnership, and the Refugee Hub at the University of Ottawa. How do you guys fit together? Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is <coughs> from the uh, University of Washington, South Africa. My framing wants a research around a practitional area of interest. It may be quite challenging, just like uh, James said. You know, PhD program is a program you start maybe after two years before you start thinking of going to the field. And considering the merit of interest, because you have to look at the interest from the supervisor, the interest from the student, you have to align this interest together and uh, possibly the interest from the founding organization. So then coming to the field and meeting practitioners, asking questions, and they want you to frame this research around their own area of interest. I'm thinking that maybe there may be a way that uh, maybe the practitioner's area of interest in line with the research, it may form maybe form some of the gap that may be discovered for next research. Mm. You know, otherwise, because it will create problem and uh, looking at the fact that a PhD, you have about three years in some places to go about it. Nobody wants to remain in the school forever. Once one, one wants to finish and maybe go to the job community and look for something. Thank you very much. One quick question, because uh, the next session is starting to uh, uh, th Thank you, Louisa. Uh, Koti Kamanga from uh, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, I thank you for your insights about the issue of the relationship between those of us who went to research academia and those on the other side, the policy makers. I thank you for those insights. And I thank you for saying that uh, the, relationship, uh, the, 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 the nexus should be a relationship. Thank God, not a marriage. <laughs> a relationship. Now, uh, I, did say I did say couples therapy. But, you know. <laughs> Precisely, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, um, uh, my question is, what should now we do, those of us who are in research, right? what should we do to guard against the relationship escalating into a marriage? Because once that happens, then 
I think there is the danger of, of losing the trust and the confidence and the respect right, of, the, of the refugees the, on behalf of whom you pretend you declare that you are, you are trying to protect and promote those interests you want to promote. Can, can you just elaborate a bit more on what you see as the dangers? If it, What is the risk of it? What are you um, envisioning yeah, uh, I, if, it, if it becomes a marriage? The, the, the risk, uh, the risk that you run if it escalates from a relationship uh, to to a marriage, I, I'm concerned with the the refugee. Right? Uh, okay. Because my primary task before me as as, an, as a researcher is to to promote and protect the interest of the refugee. So I think it is important, right? The way I look at it, it is important to appear before him or her that I'm impartial. Right? Uh, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's integrity. Uh, that I will not be swayed. Uh, I'm not under the the armpit, uh, armpit mm. of the policymaker. So this is the danger. Yeah. I, uh, okay. I see. Thank you so much. Asante sani karibu. Nimefurai kukuona hapa. I'm going to start with your question. Uh, I think that one way to guard against it becoming, you're saying like too intimate a relationship where maybe you've lost some perspective, is, if I think is what you're getting at. Um, I think it's, it's um, important to see the practitioner as another source of information uh, and an ally, but it doesn't mean that you have to um, uh, see everything the way they see it. You just have to make sure you solicit that perspective and that you include it and you understand it. Um, and, you know, if you encounter things like what was raised in, in the first question with, um, you know, someone whose perspective uh, seems particularly rigid or, uh, or counter to uh, what you're trying to achieve or what you're trying to do, um, you can either dig into that a little bit or move on and find somebody else um, who's going to work uh, better with you but also understand um, the professional distance you might need to keep. Um, and, and it's something you have to guard against all the time. I mean, I'm a former journalist. Um, I still have a really hard time, you know, revealing who I voted for. Or um, I got a hug from a cabinet minister, and I was mortified, completely mortified, because that's not. I don't want to be seen as allied with any particular party. Um, and and so I understand what you're saying, just in terms of trying to keep your eye, your focus, on the 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 person you're trying to. Um, to support really in the end you you have that in common with the practitioner and uh, and I think they will understand um, if you try to keep that that distance um, okay so going back to um, I think you had asked about um, some examples of good relationships uh, well I would say the one that we're doing right now a, a young researcher came to us and uh, she had some money left over and uh, wanted to work on something related to private sponsorship. Uh, and that was hugely helpful to us. So she's going to help us. We have a database of private sponsors. We want to ask them all kinds of questions um, related to our work with them. And so it's going to help us improve our practice. Um, and so she's been very flexible and responsive. She's challenged us, uh, and, uh, and we've challenged her. And uh, it's looking really positive. Um, she's bringing some money into it. We're able to put a bit of money into it. Um, and best of all, it has a really short timeline. Uh, so that's really exciting for us because we'll be able to put the learning into practice very quickly. Um, we've also worked with um, some other researchers who came to us. Sometimes we just connect them to contacts. Uh, but in terms of people we've actually um, uh, partnered with, uh, another researcher um, who had a very specific thing that they wanted to look into. Uh, but it happened to be something that, that we were very interested in as well. And, uh, and there were lots of meetings up front to make sure that we got it right, to make sure that we framed things correctly. Um, and, and so um, that kind of coming in with an open mind and some flexibility were the real hallmarks of those relationships. Um, policy guidelines for working with settlement. Was that from you or that was from you? Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're from Manitoba, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know of any, and that would be a fantastic thing to find. Uh, and, and maybe it's out there. I don't know. Do you guys know? No. I think it, um, it probably exists in other, um, in other sectors, but uh, maybe that's something that um, you know, we could propose and work on with some, of, some partners, because I think that's a great idea. Um, and there was something else you... The 
practitioner. Um, uh, Mike, <laughs> what you talked about with, with the 6,000 offers of help, um, we experienced that as well, and, and it's fascinating. I, this is something I would love to see. Um, nobody's asked me what I would like to research, so I'll just tell you. Uh, I am really interested in, in the, the, almost the psychology of the response of Canadians. I want to know about the public opinion. I want to know... I want to dig into the dark side of goodwill. This is a book title, don't take it, uh, that a friend and I have talked about, about how mad people get when you don't want their sofa. How mad people get when you don't want their volunteer time. And how you manage that. And we try to manage that by giving people information, explaining why it's not necessary. Explaining, see this, this is a settlement sector. They're doing all these things. They don't need everything right now. Or if they do, they maybe need what you want but they don't have time to manage that interest. So um, public opinion and public response to the crisis, I would, uh, not crisis, the, the Syrian response and others, I'd love, if you guys have um, some citations, please send them to me um, at refugee613, info at refugee613.ca. Um, but Mike, you specifically asked um, about the, the roles and mandate of OLIP, Refugee Hub, and Refugee 613. Refugee Hub is the easiest to explain. Um, they're primarily about refugee law. So I, I tease them that they're, they're kind of misnamed because it makes it sound like everything refugee related goes around them as a refugee hub. But they are focused on refugee law and on they provide um, volunteer lawyers to support um, private sponsors in their applications. They do all kinds of important work on the law itself um, and teaching and et cetera. So that's, uh, and they're also doing some promotion of the private sponsorship model abroad through the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative. OLIP and Refugee 613, the easiest way to explain the difference is that OLIP is working on a broader level. It's the Ottawa Local Immigration Partnership. So it's all immigrants and it's about creating systemic change and ensuring that Ottawa does the best job it can to retract and retain immigrants. So in the beginning, there was overlap because we were convening a lot of the same people that OLIP was convening on bigger, broader questions. Um, and, uh, and so OLIP sort of pulled back on that during the, the big response time. And now we've pulled back, so we don't have half the working groups we used to have because once the emergency response was uh, over, um, they really weren't needed. It was duplication. Um, but our niche is very much about communications, being a knowledge broker, knowledge mobilizer. Uh, and so we fit into what OLIP is doing, and they're one of our partners. Um, so I hope that clarifies it for you. Um, oh, and um, the gentleman from South Africa. Where are you? There you are. Um, so I think your question was about, um, about talking to practitioners and at, at what stage you're talking to them. And, it's, and, and it sounded to me a little bit like... Um, if I understood correctly, that you're, ta you're, you're still talking about talking to practitioners further down the line than I would suggest. No? Yes. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So I hope I didn't give the impression that, that you need to only consider the settlement perspective. But it is that you need to solicit it and include it and reflect on it. Uh, but if it, if it is seriously not going to address the issue that you want to address and you can find other partners to work with, um, by all means, continue. But you need to give the practitioners, if you want to involve practitioners, and, and I would say you should, um, that, that you need to um, solicit and consider their input um, because your work will be better for it. You'll know more. Uh, you will be, you, you will have the full universe of perspective. Um, and if you get it early on, it can help you to make um, better decisions as you go forward.
I think I think I get it, but I would I would just say no one says that you have to do what they say. I'm just saying that you need to consider it and you need to understand why they're saying what they say and make sure that you've absorbed it and reflected on it. And uh, and you know, if it's still not going to get you where you need to go, then you don't have to do what they're saying. What I'm saying is what's not happening now in too many cases is that that perspective is not even being discussed, which is why we'll see, we'll see research that someone got like hundreds of thousands of dollars to do and their conclusion you know, uh, is so divorced from reality because they weren't talking to people on the ground. So it's just, it's, it's, it's a remedy. I mean, James asked me to be a bit provocative today, so I've gone, I've gone overboard. You know, I'm not saying that the practitioners have to dictate the research, not at all. But I'm saying let's write the balance and get their voice more included. Um, and while we're at it, the voice of the research subjects themselves, of course. Um, but it's that balance that we need to strive for. Was there one more question? No? Okay. All right. Good. Thank you for your thoughtful advice. <laughs> I always wonder if you read the things that you always have to things. And then you certainly gave us the things that we think about. As a supervisor of the student and as a researcher, things that we need to really critically look at in what we are going to do. As a problem of application, I know we have a lot of times that things will be added differently. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, I've got a few Carlton yeah, pens. Yeah. it's different. You would like this one. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. A few words on uh, logistics and, and again, again to express my sincere thanks on the question of the role of the research. Of course, the, the, the role of a researcher is to work with partners, but then to take the questions and preoccupations, and then frame that in a way that, of course, reflects the uh, the, the scholarly uh, the scholarly tradition. And I think that's a, a walk that we can continue to navigate. Um, a few points on uh, scheduling. So here we are uh, on a Friday afternoon, uh, and I know that our our numbers may continue to dwindle throughout the day as flights need to be caught and what have you. I would just ask, uh, if, if I may, uh, uh, KK and Osama. And Louisa, if we could just have a quick conversation at the, at the end of this session about the closing uh, panel and how we're going to structure that. Uh, to let you know that uh, because we've run a little bit over on this, that the next session will start at 10.45, but we'll still need to end at noon. Uh, during the break, I invite you to take advantage, of course, of the, of the caffeine that is, uh, that is available. But please uh, take note in the program that uh, during the uh, coffee breaks and during the lunch breaks today, there is a, uh, a presentation uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, Canadian Historic, uh, the Canadian Network of Humanitarian History has a, a, a curated display that's running in room uh, 2228. So from the, it's the far corner room, uh, the smaller of the two rooms on the second floor near the uh, refreshment table. Please take advantage of that during the coffee breaks and then during the lunch break. Please also remember that the CARFM's annual general meeting will be in this room uh, from uh, starting at 12.30 today. So I encourage as many of you as possible to attend that annual general meeting for some exciting news. Uh, and of course, uh, to uh, have some quick lunch uh, before that and come into this room for 12.30. Uh, the concurrent sessions will then start uh, at 10.45 and I hope everyone enjoys this home stretch of Carfum's 2018 hitter Carlton. Thank you very much.